The heck with bunting. Who who wants to bunt anyway when you have a chance to win the game? Keston Hira wins it for the Brew Crew. He was trying. He bunted on the first pitch. Bunting's dumb in in certain moments. Brewers win. Garrett Mitchell clutch first big league homer. What a win! They needed it. Doesn't matter how, as long as you win these days. Let's talk about a big walk off winner. You are Locked On Brewers, your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Just when you're thinking you're out, they pull you right back in. I'm Dominic Catronio. This is Locked On Brewers, your only daily podcast, Monday through Friday, dedicated to your brew crew all season long. I'm the post-game host on WTMJ for Brewers Extra Innings, and I'm also the statistician for Bally Sports Wisconsin. This was a game the Brewers could not afford to lose, especially with Corbin Burns on the mound against the Pirates. It stunk that he didn't have his best stuff. You could argue he was rolling just fine aside from two pitches that he wants back. And furthermore, that the Brewers' offense got off to such a great start, cooled off, and then were picked up off the deck in the final two innings. This was a massive win for the Brew crew. They don't gain any ground, per se, in either the central or the wild card, any effective ground, per se. But they didn't lose any. And quite frankly, not losing ground is a win at this point. You know other teams are going to start losing. Just get wins, win series, and take a step forward. The Brewers could not afford to lose this game. You you can't afford to lose games with Corbin Burns on the mound. Yes, it seems like he's been slumping over the last uh, month or so, especially with the strikeout totals, and especially these last two starts. It doesn't matter. It's Corbin Burns. It's one of your most consistent starters. He still gave you six innings, even though he allowed eight hits. He clearly didn't have his best stuff again today. But the, the point with Corbin is the run support showed up late, Got him off the hook for the no decision. Doesn't need to be perfect every single time. And O'Neal Cruz, man, I tip my cap to you. That dude is six foot seven. He controls the bottom of the zone better than anybody I've seen. That's even even like a six foot four guy. He controls the bottom of the zone so well. He dared Corbin Burns to come back into the wheelhouse on that three one pitch and hit a ball that still hasn't come down uh, into right field. But granted. It didn't make a difference in the game. The Brewers ended up winning thanks to Garrett Mitchell and Keston here. We'll do a quick game recap. I want to go over three plays you might have forgotten about that I feel were massive to the impact of this game. A couple of unsung heroes as well. Uh, and get a playoff picture again here on this beautiful Tuesday morning. Recap-wise, though, the Brewers, they were four for six with runners in scoring position last night. Yes, I know the last four runs scored via home run with the two-run shots from Mitchell and from Hira, but that third inning was a perfect microcosm of what the Brewers' offense is supposed to look like. How much did you see them go up the middle, go opposite field, take the we, not me, swings, and keep the line moving? The Brewers, even the first out of the inning, Omar Narvaez tried to go against the shift. He ended up grounding out. Then Mitchell draws a walk. He gets caught stealing going to second base. But he steals the bag anyway because he's that fast. That put a little spark into the Brewers. Yelich manages a single up the middle, but they hold up Mitchell. There was some confusion in this third inning of the chaos that Jason Lane had to face with the traffic coming around third base. So you got runners on the corners and only one out. So you're fearing, oh, man, just don't hit a ground ball, Willie. Please don't hit a ground ball, Willie. He hits a single into right field the opposite way. It scores Mitchell. They put Yelich to second base. Uh, And then finally... Uh, Rowdy Telez, a single into left field, the opposite field, and Jason Lane decided to hold or decided to send Christian Yelich this time, and he gets thrown out at the plate by Jack Sawinski. So he held up Mitchell, he did end up scoring, and then he sends Yelich, and he fails to score. So you're thinking, man, are they really going to only get one run out of this? Nope. Hunter Renfro to save the day, an opposite field rocket double down the right field line. And it scores two, Rowdy Telez all the way from first, uh, as well as Adamas from second base. The Brewers needed it because, for one, they finally got some activity with runners in scoring position and not just relying on the home run ball. For two, like we said, the opposite field stuff. And for three, though, a big negative point of this is Rowdy Telez's development. What we learned 
after the game. Roddy Telez was pulled after this mad dash from first to home. Roddy Telez did not return the defense. We learned after the game, right knee discomfort. Remember last season in September when his knee flared up and he had to miss some time on the injured list for the Brewers. In fact, he missed from the no-hitter on September 11th until the second-to-last game of the season. Granted, he had a great NLDS, but the Brewers need his bat in this chase. The Brewers' division was decided in September of last year. It was already done for. Whereas now, they are on the outside looking in. They will need Rowdy Telez. But Craig Council said after the game, it seems like it was just a flare-up of that inflammation again, and it might have scared Rowdy more than it actually injured him. According to Council, he's walking around okay. They expect him to be day-to-day, which is a sigh of relief. See how he bounces back here today when we get back to the ballpark later this afternoon. But Rowdy exits, and Kesson here enters the game to set the stage for him to get the job done later in the contest. Burns was rolling through the first four innings. He had four strikeouts through four, allowed a couple of weak singles, but there was no reason to have any concern before what happened in the fifth inning. Three consecutive singles produced a run, but granted, one was a bloop to left, one was a broken bat flare to right, and the other one was a line drive single up the middle. Only one of those three hits was actually hit hard. And of the eight hits he allowed, what's wild is only two of them went for extra bases, the two home runs. There were three infield hits, a couple of broken bat hits too. It was a weird day for Corbin Burns. I truly believe he didn't pitch that bad, but the lack of strikeouts in this month of August has been somewhat alarming for Corbin. We'll keep an eye on that here in the end of the season. I don't know if fatigue is catching up to him, the amount of innings this season. He's going to get close to 175, even close to 200 innings by year's end, but the Brewers are obviously going to need him at least on his B game. Today was like his C-plus game as far as the amount of contact he was allowing in the contest. But it sets the stage. Falling behind 3-0 on O'Neill Cruz is very uncharacteristic of Corbin Burns. He gets a called strike onto Cruz, and then a cutter low. Cruz demolishes it. I tweeted the numbers during the game. O'Neill just dominates the lower third of the zone. The lower third, all three zones, he's hitting over 400 for his bad pip, and now his sixth home run against the Brewers this year. Simply incredible for a guy that's that tall getting to pitches low in the zone. He doesn't like it up, and he doesn't like it in. That's where you have to try to command the zone. If he beats you in, tip your cap. If he beats you up, tip your cap. But that's what the scouting report says. Corbin made a mistake, missed over the plate. Doesn't matter that it was low. He missed over the plate. Good hitters are going to punish that, and that's what happened. Brewers down 4-3 to three in the blink of an eye. Their offense wasn't doing much. They leave the bases loaded in the bottom of the fifth. And that's when my Twitter started to explode. All the negativity. Oh, it's over. These guys are fraud. Oh, my gosh. This is brutal. That's why you play nine innings, guys. It's a nine-inning game. It's not a five-inning game. It's a nine-inning game. It's never over. It's never. And this team has come back so many times, so many walk-offs. If you want to get mad at the Brewers in the fifth inning, you haven't been paying attention. This is what they do. It's not supposed to be easy, especially with this team right now. If you're getting in my mentions in the fifth inning of a one-run game, get out of here. Shut up and watch the game, man. This game is so hard, and there is still so much time left. They were only halfway through the game. I'm a half glass, I'm a glass half full guy. I'm getting riled up right now, man. Come on. Let the, the game play out. You're thinking, oh, we've seen this movie a million times. They're going to flirt with you, then they're going to lose the game. Let them play. And look. They played, and they made it work. And there's always going to be that poo-poo guy that says, oh, well, it's the Pirates. It's what they're supposed to do. Who cares? Winning is all that matters. The Yankees just lost to the Angels. They lost a series to the A's. You think they're freaking out right now? Yeah, they absolutely are. Just like you were freaking out, and I was freaking out, when the Brewers lost a series and got swept by the Pirates. There's appropriate times to react when the game is over, not in the middle of it. Okay? Okay. And there was a lot of panic when Rodolfo Castro hit that home run too. But Garrett Mitchell saves the day in the eighth to tie it with two outs. More on the the at-bat before that in just a second. And then Keston Hira, he bunted the first pitch foul. Thank goodness for that. Because with a 1-2 count, he rips it off the top of the wall in left field. His third career walk-off home run. (sighs) What a game. Brewers win 7-5. Let's get to see to some of the big plays he might have forgotten about and some unsung heroes 
from this contest. Before we do that, I want to tell you about our friends at LinkedIn. If you own a small business or you have friends that own a small business, football season, maybe you're circling around it, fall, you know, maybe in the hiring season as things start to cool down, LinkedIn Jobs is going to make it easier to find the right people to hire and to talk to faster and for free. You can join the world's largest professional network with over 810 million people. You can add your job simply on your LinkedIn profile. You can use the purple hashtag hiring frame, and you can spread the word that you're hiring so that way your network can help you find the right people. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs is going to help you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every single week, Nearly 40 million job seekers are visiting LinkedIn. I've been one of them. Post your job for free at LinkedIn jobs or at LinkedIn.com slash locked on MLB. Again, LinkedIn.com slash locked on MLB. Terms and conditions apply. Brewers, I'm gonna three plays and three unsung heroes from this seven to five win last night for the brew crew. Let's go for the three plays first. Uh, And I'm going to go in chronological order here. The first play that I thought was significant may not seem like a whole lot. We go to the fifth inning. First two batters retired, Adamas and Hira. Then a single through the left side by Hunter Renfro, who, by the way, had three hits in this game. Then this is the play that I think jumps out to me. With two strikes and two outs, Colton Wong continues the rally, hitting a comebacker to Eric Stout, who kicked the ball. If Stout lets that ball go through... The inning is over, and we think nothing of it. You Brewers leave a man on first after a mini little two-out base hit. You think nothing of it. Instead, Stout kicks the baseball, stays in the game, and then walks Andrew McCutcheon after getting ahead of him 0-2, and that would be the last batter that Stout faced. And I also thought it was rather odd that not only did Stout obviously face Colton Wong get hit in the foot, he stayed in. For the the righty, Andrew McCutcheon, when the righty, Johan Ramirez, was getting up, I'm surprised Derek Shelton didn't pull him, but there's been a lot of things that Derek Shelton surprised me with this season. Uh, I ended up working out here because then Johan Ramirez came in when Luis Arias was announced as the pinch hitter. The thought was to try to get the lefty through Jace Peterson, but as soon as you saw Andrew McCutcheon coming up, you had to figure that they had to be ready for the righty because you knew are you going to face Arias right on right or are you going to face Jace left on left with two outs? That was the decision that they had to make, but I still would have avoided McCutcheon facing a lefty uh, and then lived to fight another inning. Nonetheless, though, I thought that kick of the ball extended the inning and then Arias ended up grounding out. Granted, he only saw one true strike, maybe two. I thought the pitch that was down at the bottom of the zone was pretty close, but... Strike Zone had a tough night last night, and Urias got the short end of the stick in his at-bat in the fifth. Nonetheless, he grounds out, put the ball in play, so took it out of the umpire's hands. Brewers, so now they're trailing 4-3 through five innings. So that's my first play you might have forgotten about. Second play you might have forgotten about. We go to the top of the seventh inning. Brent Suter's now on. He gets the first man, Jason DeLay, to fly out to center field. But then a walk to Cruz and a single by Reynolds. So now they're in business. Runners on first and second, and only one out. And here comes Ben Gamel, who has been a Brewer killer this season. Over a 300 average against the Brew Crew. He hits a little squibber over to the right side. Colton Wong thought about turning two on this one. Remember, he spun but bobbled the ball. The fact that he was able to recover, keep his timing, and toss and get the out at first base, I thought was very significant because, number one, he realized, look, just get the sure out. Don't try to do too much. His defense has been a huge difference maker in the second half. He has righted the ship with his leather. He is making great plays, and he's making the routine plays. In the first half, he was failing on the routine plays and sometimes making the exponentially amazing plays. That hasn't been the case so far here in the second half. So I thought that play was huge because then Suter calms down, buckles down, and gets Michael Chavis to strike out. I thought that was a very significant play by Colton Wong. Get the sure out and live to fight for another inning. That was huge with the Brewers trailing 5-3. to And finally, the last play that you might have forgotten about, and this is my biggest play of the game. Two outs, bottom of the eighth inning. Dwayne Underwood Jr. is rolling right now. He's retired five in a row despite allowing the leadoff single to Willie Adamas back in the seventh. 
So now we're here in the eighth. Omar Narvaez, he's been ice cold since coming off the injured list. Hasn't been doing a whole lot. Here he is. He falls behind with a one and two count after a swing and miss. Then he goes, takes a close pitch, fouls off a tough pitch, takes a close pitch, breaks his bat on another foul ball, then hits another foul ball, and on the ninth pitch of the at-bat, draws a walk. That was huge because it set the stage for Garrett Mitchell to hit the epic tying home run on a 1-0 pitch with a new uh, righty on the mound, Will Crow. They were going for the four-out save. They weren't going for the platoon matchup. They were going for their most effective reliever in that opportunity for the Pirates. So Mitchell obviously hits the home run. But get this. The Brewers were obviously trailing 5-3 to three before the Mitchell home run. But when Omar Narvaez walked, the win probability was still 89% and only improved by 2%, from 91% to 89% after his walk. Then the win probability shifted, obviously, into the Brewers' favor with Garrett Mitchell's home run. Narvaez is partially to credit for that, in my opinion. That was a massive ex- exhibition of plate discipline to keep in the Brewers in this game, and that's what they are built off of. Smart aggressiveness when it comes to pitches per plate appearance. We've talked about it ad nauseum. They lead baseball in pitches per PA, and then setting the stage to hit the home runs. The big swings is how they get things done and how they separate themselves from opponents. Garrett Mitchell, welcome to the show, man. What a moment. A curtain call. Crowd went nuts. Crowd is so aware of it last night. That was so much fun to see. Family going nuts. I saw after the game while I was doing the post-game show, his whole family got onto the field. And him and his hug probably him and his mom probably hugged for about like a full two minutes straight. That was a beautiful moment, in my opinion. And, and the shot of his dad crying uh, in the stands. How, how can you not be romantic about baseball? Right? Uh, really quick. Three unsung heroes from this game before we look at the playoff picture now. Three unsung heroes from this game. Number one, it has to be Brent Suter. Happy birthday, Brent Suter, by the way, yesterday. Two scoreless innings, leaves runners stranded in both of them. He also got a pair of strikeouts. He even got O'Neill Cruz uh, to... He ended up walking O'Neill Cruz, but he worked into six pitches, and he got out of the jam thanks to that ground ball that we already mentioned and a strikeout of Chavis. Aside from that, he had two strikeouts, a little pop-out, Never really was in danger, aside from that seventh inning. Great work from Brent Suter. Second unsung hero from this game, Willie Adamas. Three more hits for Willie, including the RBI single in the third. He started the rally in the ninth with a single up the middle. What I love about Willie, he's been burned, I tweeted this, so many times on bad called strikes in clutch moments. You have not seen Willie been ejected, ever. He calmly talks to the unplayed umpire, saying, look, man, That was down. I need you to understand, I did not like that call. I respectfully disagree. I know your job is hard, but hey, I'm not trying to impact how your zone is going to be for me for the rest of this game and the rest of my teammates, but I just want to let you know that ball was down. Then he manages to single up the middle, so ball doesn't lie. But that was a massive moment in this game that maybe a less mature or a younger player or a less experienced player would lose it and already lose the mental battle of saying, oh, well, I don't know what this zone is. I'm going to lose this. I don't, I got to swing at everything. Now, Willie just stayed in his approach, singles right back up the middle. That was a huge moment in my eyes. And third and finally, the last unsung hero from this game for me is Devin Williams. And that might sound silly. Like, well, why is Devin Williams your unsung hero? Devin, once again, is still trying to figure things out right now. He hasn't quite been himself in the last couple of weeks. And... Think about it. The last time Devin saw these Pirates, he gave up a walk-off home run to Brian Reynolds. And he was facing Brian Reynolds and O'Neill Cruz again in a big spot. He struck out Cruz on a fastball. He ended up hitting Brian Reynolds. He gets uh, Ben Gamble to pop out and finally Michael Chavis to strike out on a changeup. And what that bat that was with Michael Chavis. Eight pitches deep, gets him on a changeup. Michael Chavis is now 0 for 3 in his career against Devin with three strikeouts. I thought that was a, a very important moment and a very important shout out as Devin earns the win in this seven to five victory for the Brewer crew. Let's look at the playoff picture. Not everything was great yesterday for the Brewers, but let's get the lay of the land after this. Okay. Playoff picture. Now Brewers didn't gain any ground just to tell you, but they did gain ground with some good news and bad news on the Phillies. So the good news is the Phillies lost yesterday. 
So they lose 13-7. to The bad news is it was to the Diamondbacks. And the worst news is the Diamondbacks scored 13 unanswered in that game. Yeah, the Phillies were up 7-0. And then the Diamondbacks hung a 13 on them and won 13-7. to That is not going to be an easy series this weekend. I know they're under 500. They're 60-67. and Ball flies at Chase Field. You're going to see their aces. You're probably going to see Zach Allen. You're probably going to see Merrill Kelly. They got a bunch of rookies, a bunch of young talent. Cattell Marte, obviously, is the headliner. Christian Walker is the best first baseman that nobody's talked about. I said that yesterday. They just called up their young prospect, Corbin Carroll, got his first hit yesterday. Uh, also, seen Stone Garrett go off so far. They That's going to be a tough weekend, just an FYI. So that's the bad news. Also, the bad news is the Padres held on against the Giants, 6-5. to five. San Francisco put a furious rally up late, but could not get over the hump. So the Brewers don't lose any ground to the Padres. They're a game and a half, essentially two games back of San Diego. But they gain a game, of course, on Philly. So they're currently uh, three back of Philadelphia, but essentially three and a half back for the second wild card spot. The Brewers are 68 and 59. 35 games to go from here to the rest of the season. I mean, let, let's look at it. If the Brewers get 22, if they go 22 and 13 over these last 35 games, that gets them to 90 wins. Will that be enough? Or does it need to be something closer to 24? It's going to come down to the wire. So buckle up. It's going to get crazy. And by the way, the Cardinals, they stomp the Reds 13-4. to Are you really surprised? I put a tweet out yesterday. This leads me to my playoff picture stuff as well about blind resumes and who's going to be second place in the National League MVP voting. So the reason I put this out is because I want to remind folks what the Cardinals have on their roster and also what the Brewers, quite frankly, don't have. So three options here. My question was, who's going to be second in MVP? First place is going to go to Paul Goldschmidt. There's nothing you can do to convince me otherwise. I put the blind resumes up. The numbers are pretty similar for play, player A and player B. About a 280 average, about a 350 on base, about a 560 slug, and about a 910 OPS. Ne- identical home run totals, nearly identical double totals. Advanced stuffs are pretty much identical as far as weighted runs created plus and OPS plus. But then player C has an over 300 average, a 370 on base, a 567 slug, an over 930 OPS. Leads and weighted runs created plus and OPS plus of these three players. More doubles than these three players. Fewer homers, though. A better strikeout rate than any of these three players. And a really good walk rate compared to these three players. Undoubtedly, you would pick player C based on these metrics. Well, player C is Nolan Arenado. The the Cardinals are going to probably go 1-2 in National League MVP voting. The Brewers are probably not going to get a single representative in the top 20, right? There's no chance. Last year, the only representative was Willie Adamas. Obviously, Corbin Burns won the Cy Young. He's not going to be winning it this year. The Brewers aren't going to be collecting any hardware. We know that for a fact. And quite frankly, unless Craig Council pulls off this miracle and gets this team into the postseason, he's not going to be a finalist for manager of the year. In my opinion, that goes to the Phillies and Rob Thompson. I digress. What the Cardinals have is their corners playing at MVP caliber levels. They are doing what they're supposed to be doing to the rest of the league, not just the Brewers. They have the best record in baseball in the second half with the Dodgers. They have the best corner players in baseball. They have gold glove defense all over the place. They have the magic of Pujols, the magic of Molina in their final seasons. Adam Wainwright has been tremendous. They had a really good deal with Jordan Montgomery. The Cardinals are a good team. Tip your cap. It sucks. Show some respect. But also remind yourself what the Brewers are doing right now with a chance that they have to still make the playoffs without any household names, without anyone that's going to finish in the top 20 in MVP voting is an example of what the Brewers are built off of. They're built off run prevention, not run scoring. So the fact when Corbin Burns struggles like we've seen this week, it feels magnified. Like, wait, this is what the Brewers are good at. Why is this guy struggling? Or when Devin Williams struggles, or when 
Uh, Brandon Woodruff, he's dominating right now. He's been great. But now you got to have Jason Alexander start tonight instead of Adrian Hauser, who was so good in the second half last year. It's conflicting right now for the Brewers. But they still got a chance. 35 to go. Trying to chase down Goliath with a slingshot. That and the Goliath, of course, is uh, the Cardinals right now. But maybe the target really is the Padres or the Phillies. Remains A lot remains to be seen for the Brewers the rest of this season. All I know is if you want to hop on the bandwagon now, it's a good time to do it. If you want to hop off, that's fine. We'll let you back on in Craig Timber. But buckle up. This is what you play for. There's not much time left. It's real now. This was a massive gut punch win for the Brewers because Burns didn't have his best stuff. They had to pick up their starter, and they keep the opportunity for a sweep alive. All right? Remember, it's a nine-inning game, not a five-inning game. Let the game play out. Let's have some fun tonight. Brewers have Jason Alexander on the mound. They moved Adrian Hauser to the bullpen. Keep an eye out for that if they go double sinker baller at some point in this game tonight. Uh, on the other side, it'll be Mitch Keller, who's been a lot better as of late. He'll be a, a really good uh, a test for the Brewers. Young right-hander, one of their top prospects from the back, back a few years for the Pirates. TBD tomorrow for the Pirates might be JT Brubaker. We don't know yet. He is on the paternity list, so congratulations to the Brubakers. And then the Brewers tomorrow will have Freddie Peralta going in the last game of the year against Pittsburgh. It's not supposed to be easy. The stories aren't good when the games are easy, right? Stressful, fun, and it's feeling like playoff baseball right now. When If the Brewers get into the postseason, like psh, high stress, tough innings, we've been doing this all season long. They're just getting ready. Just got to get in. All right. Thank you for listening. What a day at the ballpark. Shout out to Keston Hira. Shout out to Garrett Mitchell. Shout out to California. What a day. Brewers win 7-5. to five. Back at it tonight at 7-10. I've got the post-game show tonight as well after the contest on WTMJ. I'm Dominic Catronio. Thank you for listening. If you like the pod, drop a review, drop a rating. Follow us, follow us on Twitter at LockedOnBrewers. Follow myself at Dom underscore Catronio. And be right here. Same time, same place for your first listen tomorrow morning. Until next time, keep on swinging. You are Locked On Brewers, your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.